Okay, well, thank you and thanks for coming. The idea is to have this every month, the last week of the month, um, not in December, but otherwise when we are open. And which day of the week we, we can adjust according to the speaker and other things. Okay, so what I'll talk ab about is, um, is impartial games, which is, um, I think, is a very nice theory and um, it's very elementary, but I think it's something worth knowing if you've never seen it before. So let me start with um, the sort of mother of all games of, of this kind called, at least in English, it's called NIM. Maybe you guys from other countries may have seen it and have different names. And so it consists of um, the following. Uh, you can start with um, any number of objects in piles. So I'll do this example. And this is something actually I played uh, at least once when I was a kid. So you have um, five um, piles. And the game consists, uh, there is a, is, a play, is a game with two players. And uh, each player has uh, a possible move. And the move in this game consists of taking any number of objects from one pile. So you choose the pile and you take whichever you number of objects you want. And uh, in all of these games, the, the, the story will be the same, that if you cannot play, you lost. Or to put it another way, if you are the last person to play, you win. OK, Is it, it, are the rules clear? So I'd like to play with you. Would you can all of them, choo all of you choose? Or let's see if I can make this work and I'll, I'll see if I can win. Maybe you would win. So why don't you start? Pick uh, any pile. There's five piles with five, four, three, two things in it. And you can uh, choose one pile and take however many you like. No, no, let me repeat. So there's, there's these possible moves you can make, which is to remove from one pile any number of objects you like. So for example, from this pile of five, you can take three out or take five out, whatever you want. And then is the turn for the next, for the opponent and repeats. And the game ends when there's nothing left and there's no possible move. In that case, if you face with a situation where you cannot move, you've lost. Remove, yeah. No, no, I, I mean move as a general uh, idea of, of something you can do in the game. But in this case, it means remove from the pile. So, have you, uh, has anybody seen this game before? Yes? Uh, what do you call it in your country? How do you call it in your country? NIM. NIM. You call it NIM. Okay. So you know the strategy too? Oh, okay. Well, so then, y then you shouldn't play. <laughs> okay, then you, you too cannot play. Come on, something. From this one, you take three. And I'll, I'll make a little numerology on the rest on the side. And uh, what I'll do is explain what I'm doing. later, but if you want to start moving ahead and thinking what the uh, story is, you can look at that. So I'll remove three from here, right? So now I'm going to copy it on the side so we have uh,
So it wasn't such a great move. OK, I'll explain. So I'll try to do a good move now, Let's see if I can do that. Um, I'll change this to 0, 1, 0. So I'll take 2 out of this. So now it's your turn. Anybody wants to try? Come on, we don't know where to hear. Oh, you also want to win, I think. Take all three out of the, this one. So. So this one So unfortunately if I do this right now you'll never have a good move. So at this point if I play this correctly I'm guaranteed to win. And uh, so what I should do to do that is change for example this one to that. So from one of the twos, I mean at this point it should be easy to see just eyeballing it, but since I'm bad at that, I'll just do my numbers. And while you look at the game, you should also look at what I'm writing here and trying to see what, if anything, is happening. So, come on, uh, we, we're kind of close to the end, I think. So, what should do you try to do? Remove this one here. So, I... I made a mistake somewhere, no? The first one. Oh, now I got lost. Just leave it. Change the first one. Ah. Like that. So what do we have here? We had a one here, no? Ooh, now, oh yeah, so this, this became zero. Is that right? So I should just take this one out. So, yeah? So, you give up. You give up. <laughs> so on the, other s on the other hand, what is it that I've been doing over here? Um, yeah, you tell me. Right, so what I wrote here was the numbers of objects that I had, which I started with 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I wrote them in binary. And then what I did is treat these numbers as if they were vectors mod 2. I forget that they were actually binary expansions. And I think of them as, as zeros and ones. And I added with the binary addition. So 1 plus 1 is 0 and so on. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 0. 1 plus 1 is 0. So that was the thing you saw. 
And then you did this move, and it go went back to a sum, 1, 1, 0. And then I, um, I did this move that made it into 0, the sum. OK, uh, I'll, I'll, that's, that's the point that we, we're getting to. But so w this is my move, right? So what did I do every time? Well, she already said it. No. What I managed to do is every time I did a move which resulted in the total sum to be 0, OK? Now, what that meant is that any move you did will make the sum not zero because you can only move one row and you cannot change a row and keep the sum to be zero. So every time um, I moved, I managed to get a zero. Every time you moved, you managed to make a non-zero and so on. So this went on until we're done. And so um, the last position is when there's nothing left and the sum is zero. I got there and you are faced with not being able to move and so you lost. So the, the idea then, one way, graphical way to think of this that I think it, it helps in, in my mind is that somehow the game schematically consisted of something like a, like a lever like this. And uh, it started off being tilted, so the sum not being zero. And um, what I've always tried to do is put it into a level situation. So schematically, every move that I did, because I managed to get to a point where I could, is to put it into a equilibrium. And every time you moved, you took it out of the equilibrium in different forms, the sums other than zero were all kinds of things, but um, having I'd be able to get to zero, I managed uh, you to be forced to move it out of the equilibrium, so to speak. So for example, what would have been a good move for you? This is what you saw. What would have been a, a move that took it from this uh, non-equilibrium situation to in equilibrium situation. Um, in this case, there's only one offending column. So all you have to do is fix that one. And so you can take any one of these that is a 1 and make it a 0. So that is to take 1 out uh, of the corresponding column. So you have three good moves to make. Take 1 out of any one of these three columns. And you could also have achieved a 0 by making this 0 equal to a 1. But of course, that's not good, because in the game, you can't go up. You always go down. So I think with, with these thoughts, you can find, now you can uh, think of a strategy of how you will always win, as long as the opponent doesn't know the strategy, <laughs> or by chance, manage to put itself Face, make you face a zero position or a level position, then um, you should be able to get to that equilibrium position and from then on always move uh, in this fashion. So the game is, um, is nice because it has this complete um, description of, uh, of the strategy and um, and it's very um, very simple. Now, for those of you uh, who have already done a bit of research and so on, you may be you may get a kick out of the fact that this was maybe known earlier. But the, there's a, the paper that describes this mathematically is by a Frenchman called Charles Bouton, who published a paper in 1901 in the Annals of Mathematics, <laughs> where he describes this. OK, so, um, and basically, the, in, the theory that I'd like to describe to you is that 
I'll describe these games, impartial games, and the theorem is that they're all equal to NIM. So once you know the strategy for NIM, you know the strategy for, in principle, all other games that are impartial. And so what does that mean to be impartial? An impartial game is that you have two players that alternate playing, as we did. The moves are the same for both. So the first line could have included chess. The second one eliminates chess, because you can't move the other op opponent's pieces. There's complete information. So nothing is hidden. You, it, both players know exactly what's happening. There's no chance. You don't throw a dive or anything like that to, to play. And the player, unable to, to move, loses. This is called normal play. And then there is a completely different thing, which is if you exa do exactly the opposite, which is that the person unable to play wins. And that's called, um, so this is opposite, opposed to, uh, it's called misère play in, from French. And this one, interestingly enough, has no strategy. This is a very difficult thing to analyze in general. OK. And um, so the, the mathematical theorem here, somewhat, or sort of loosely, I'll, I'll make it somewhat vague, which is all impartial games Well, a, a fancy way to say this would be that they're isomorphic. There's a way to convert a game into one that looks like NIM, for which we discuss the strategy. Now, in practice, of course, when things are isomorphic, the isomorphism doesn't mean that they're equal. And computing the isomorphism could be very difficult if, in the, if you have, there are some very complicated games in which this it's not completely clear how helpful it is. But the theory, anyway, is, is, that, is this one. And so this, I think, is a pretty remarkable fact. And I'll illustrate a little bit how this works. And if, um, if you like this type of thing, I recommend very highly a book by Guy So uh, Berlecamp, Conway, and Guy, which discuss many, many things, uh, among them this uh, impartial games. It's, a, it's one of the most idiosyncratic books I've ever seen. And sometimes the style is a bit grating, but, uh, but it has an incredible amount of stuff you can't find anywhere else. So rather than, so anyway, in particular, they have many different kinds of games, many of which were invented by Conway, which are, of course, incredibly sophisticated and subtle. But let me discuss only uh, for now one other type of game, which um, just to give you a flavor of that, there are many different games that you can discuss, which are fairly simple to describe. And they all fit into this category. So a simple example would be um, a subtraction game. So this is an example where you have a collection of numbers s, in this case 1 and 2, and you start with one pile of objects. And then you can, the moves are you can take out of the pile a, one or two objects. OK, so uh, and again, the rule of ending is the same. If you can't move anymore, you're done. So and you can replace the set S for any other favorite set, um, 
uh, set the, um, that you like. And it's somewhat, you can see, it has a little bit of the flavor of, of NIM, but it's more than just the flavor. It's actually, in some way, exactly the same as NIM. So let's see. One way to analyze a game is to think that each state of the game, so every position of, of the status of the game, you can think of it as a uh, vertex, as a dot. So in this case, the state, is, the state of, the, of the game consists of how many things you have in your pile. There's only one pile, and it has some number of objects. So let me make a little graph and of the possible states we can have we go up to uh, six. I mean, this will continue on. And so for, and one way to describe the game is to say, well, these are the possible states. And uh, an edge, you put an edge for the possible moves that take you from one state to another state. So since we can take one, uh, we can go from six to five, from five to four, from four to three, and so on. And since we can take two, we can go from six to four, from four to two, and two to zero, and from five to three, and from three to one. So the, the game then, or the impartial game, gives rise to a directed graph, where the vertices, the dots, are the any given position of the game at a given time. And then the arrows tell you how to go from one position of the game to another. So those are the legal moves of the game. So in this case, that's the graph you'll see. So what I like to do is try to assign to these, um, these uh, states of the game a label which will be like the zero, non-zero that we had in the case of NIM. Okay, and the traditional way, the labels for that is to call the positions to be P or N. Okay, and P is like zero in the NIM case, and N is like a non-zero. And the way to describe that in terms of the graph is as follows. A P is a position where from it you can only reach N positions. So P is like the equilibrium, and from an equilibrium you can only go to non-equilibrium. So from P you can only reach Ns. And from N you should be able to reach at least one P. So if the thing is tilted, you should be able to put it back. You could also sort of tilt it a bit differently. So there's some N situations, but there should be at least one P. So P goes to only Ns, and N goes to P Ns, but at least one P, maybe more than one P. OK? And so now what we do is we're going to label recursively all the dots in this diagram as n or p. So what should this one be? It's one of these two. Well, where do you go from zero? Nowhere. So it's the empty set of places you can go to. All elements of the empty set are n, <laughs> because there is no element. So it is a P. It's like when we ended the game, well, well it didn't quite end it, but if you end the game, you, you see a P. So P is good for you, it's bad for your opponent. Because if you manage to get to a P, it means the other guy will have to go to an N. And if he gives you an N, you can move to a P. So the strategy is try to get to a P position, let the other person take you, take you out to N and bring you back to P. So every time they move the boost to N, you bring it back to P. And you go like this until the, end, the game ends. So that's the strategy. That's what we did with NIM. 
So let's try to figure out what all of these things are, uh, these positions are. So what is 1? N. You guys agree with this? Don't be shy. So why is N? Because you can go to at least 1P, right? That's what N means. You should be able to go to at least 1. one. So how about uh, 2? Also N. How about 3? You can go from 3 to 1 and from 3 to 2. And they're both N. So that's a P. Okay, so if you look at this, you'll quickly convince yourself that this is um, periodically, periodic with period 3, like this. P, N, N, P, N, N, P, N, N, P, N, N. So if you want to play this game where you have a million and a one uh, things in your pile, what should you do? Can we do, can we do, a, can we do a million more three? Maybe not. Certainly I can't here. Can somebody know what a million and one is, mod three? Oh, I think we can do that. It's two, right? So it, what is it? So a million and one. How do you know what the number is, mod two? You add the digits, no? Mod three. I learned this in primary school, like divisibility by three. So this is mod, this is two mod three. So it look, since this is cyclic of uh, period three, it looks like if it was just two, right? So we, we stand in here, which means it's good luck for us. What should we do? We should move to a P position. So we do what? We take two, right? So the good guys, the P's, are divisible by 3, so we just take enough to make it 0 more 3, if we are lucky enough to face such a thing. So if, if the opponent s saw that and knew the strategy, they will move to a P and you'll be, um, you will be unable to, to win unless the person makes a mistake. So these are all sort of, now you take your favorite set S, any number you like, and you'll see exactly the same phenomenon. The positions P and N could be, you can label all positions as P and N, and it'll be cyclic, it'll be periodic. And it's actually kind of a complicated thing to figure out what the period is. It could be very long periods in the, in the shape of this, of this thing. So um, I'll give you one other game. Um, to think about, I, this one I think uh, is actually pretty complicated and it was described by this Dutchman uh, Withoff but uh, according to Martin Gardner it was known in some of um, the African cultures before. In any case, um, it's a bit, so these games at first sound like really strange kind of, um, yes, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, um, I'll get to that, but at the moment let me just at least, le let's agree that we've managed to do somewhat similar what we did before because um, we managed to distinguish certain positions as desirable, the ones that added to zero and those that are not desirable, this, that they did not add to zero. So. Like a P is like having, having the columns add to zero and an N is having the columns not add to zero. And then once you believe that this is doable, that you can actually recursively starting from the ends of the game up and label every position with either a P or an N, you have a strategy of how to, um, of how to win. Right? And in that strategy is the same as in NIM. But I'll, I'll make that a little bit more precise and we'll, we'll uh, will sort of flesh out this statement. Okay, so here's the, this Widhoff game, which has one pile of some number of things, and you have two possibilities. You take any number 
from the pile. No, so there's two piles, otherwise this would be a little silly. So you take any number of stones or objects from one of the piles, or you take the same from both. Okay? So you decide. Either you take your favorite pile and take whatever you like from it, or you decide that you're actually going to take from both, in which case you must take the same number from both. This is actually a pretty complicated game to analyze, and the answers of which are n's and which are p positions are very pretty, which I'll, I won't tell you, but uh, not now, but uh, if you are interested, uh, we can discuss it after, after the talk. Let me just point out that it has this nice interpretation you can um, you can describe the position in the game as a pair of integers, positive integers, namely how many things there are in one pile and how many things there are in the other pile. There's two piles, like right. So this dot here would be that one one has uh, one pile has three and the other pile has two. So what are the possible moves? Well, you can take things out of one pile, which will be moving this way, any number of, any number of uh, squares you like. Or you can move this way by taking things from the other pile any number of times. Or if you do both at, the one, at once, then you should be able to, then you can only go diagonally. OK, so this is like having a queen in chess. These are the moves, possible moves of a queen, but except that it has, they only have to go sort of towards the origin. And again, the rule of the game are that if you can't move anymore, then you lost. And so now, there's, if you do the analysis, some of these cells will be P and some of these cells will be N. And you can ask yourself, well, what's the pattern that you see? And there's a very interesting pattern that shows up. So I'll leave it as an intriguing thing for you to think about. But that's sort of a fairly sophisticated game. OK, so now back to this theorem and what uh, Stefano was asking. Um, what do I mean by saying that the the games are all isomorphic. So here comes another idea that completes sort of the picture, which is that you can make the sum of two games. And what is, I think, beautiful is that this idea of thinking of the games as if they were uh, numbers, so to speak, exactly led to Conway to define a whole new crazy class of numbers called surreal numbers, okay? which is a whole interesting um, aspect of mathematics that, that is clear to me that it came from uh, elaborating on this theory. So what is a, same, uh, a sum of games? Suppose you have two games, gamma 1 and gamma 2, impartial games, that is. Okay, so just like the kinds we've discussed. So I'm going to define a new game, gamma 2 star gamma 2, uh, gamma 1 star gamma 2. So the positions on this new game are pairs of position, one in this game and one in this. Okay. So what are the moves? Okay, well the moves is very simple. So you either move in gamma 1 and don't do anything with the gamma 2 state or you or or you move in gamma 2 okay so what's an example of that 
Well, Nim. Let me give you a very silly game. One pile. Take, move, take anything you like. Okay, so that's a pretty trivial game. You have one pile and you're allowed to take anything you like. So if you face that, what would you do? Take the whole thing out. And then you're done. But now, take gamma 2 to be the same game. And take the sum. Now it became interesting, because what does this mean? Well, you have two piles. One from the gamma 1 game and another from the gamma 2 game. But now you face exactly in the NIM situation. You can take from one or from the other, but not from both. So now you see that something is somewhat missing in this N and P story. Because in the gamma 1 or gamma 2 games, just one pile, they're the same game. Um, if we were to draw, do our little p n story, what would it look like? Well, the last one is p. I don't draw the graph because there'll be too many arrows. You can go from, from anywhere, anything below. From 6, you can go to 5, to 4, to 3, to 1, to 0, right? So, and, and then anything else is connected to 0. So everything else is n. Am I right? So that's not a very interesting game. And if you take the sum of the two games, it becomes more interesting. And just knowing that this position in the game, game one is n or p, and knowing that this one is n or p doesn't tell you what the position is in the pair. Because if there were more than zero things in each one, both positions in the individual games would be n. But clearly, that doesn't mean that the position in the sum game is n. Because we are, you know, playing with two is maybe easy, but not as trivial as just one pile. And you could, of course, add more games. And then if you added five games, you'll have like the name we started with. Is that clear to everyone what I'm saying? So this operation of constructing a new game out of two, you can know everything about this game and everything about this game, and when you put them together, you still don't know uh, the full story about the new game. So what's missing is that this is somewhat a limited information. What we like to do is get a, something a little better than that. So rather than, so remember that in the NIM game, the positions were not just labeled P or N. We had a number. Or we have the sum of the columns was either zero or wasn't zero. So what's missing is that we're not just going to label these positions with a letter P or a little N. We're going to give them a number. Okay, and that information will be... Um, will be enough to recover the corresponding number in the sum of the games. So let me let's do an example. And amazingly enough, so the paper of Bouton was in 1901. Whithoff was a few years after that. And then in the 30s, these two guys, Prague and Grundy, came up with exactly the same theory. And so it's called the Sprague-Grundy um, theory that um, it allows you to um, extend this this notion to to games to any game okay so let me um, this will be the last thing I discuss we're going to give a numerical value to a position of a game not just a label NP an actual number and for that, um, I need a concept that's called the MEX. So 
So this, although Sprague was involved too, somehow it's called the Grundy function. So this is to each dot, to each state, we're going to associate a number. So that's the function, the Grundy function. And it's defined recursively using um, the notion of MEX. And MEX stands for minimum excludent. Okay, so it's as follows. If you have a subset S of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, the MEX of S is defined to be the smallest number not in S. Okay, so for example, if the set S is 0, 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 10, and 15, what's the max of S? 3. You read it, all well, these are in order, so you read it from left to right, and you first find the thing, the first gap. The first number not in the list is 3. There may be other things missing, you don't care. And what's the important property of this max? Which is really somewhat simple, but is what makes the whole thing work. When is the max of s equal to 0? How could the max of s of a set be 0? Sorry? Well, how about, how about this set? What's the max of that? 1 is not there, but the max is still 0. It's just that 0 is not there. Right? So this is actually exactly the same as saying that 0 is not in S. OK, so now I'm going to assign to every state of a game a, a number. And that number is going to be computed recursively, somewhat like what we did the PN distinction, but a little bit more sophisticated because it will give rise to numbers. So if you have a position V in your game, and you have all the possible ways, things you, you know, as an example, all the things you can reach from it, then you define the Grundy value in the game that you're playing of this vertex V to be the max of the values of the Grundy function on all the things you can reach. So you start from the bottom, OK? And um, you, those are going to get the value of 0. And you move up, and you see from each dot where it's connected to. You look at its values. And then you, look, you take the max of that, and you keep going recursively up. And then because of this property, the 0 value will exactly correspond to being a p position. And the non-zero value will correspond to being an n position. But now n got sort of colored. It's not just n. It has a number attached to it. OK. I'm not sure I'll be able to exp explain this in much detail, but at least I'll give you a bit of the, the ingredients that go into this. So let's do an example. Maybe this is the, the easiest thing to do. So let's take the subtraction game the one that we were looking at before, where our set is S 
equals 1 and 2. So remember, that means that from a pile we can either take one thing or two things. Okay, so we take um, just the diagram we had before, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, these were, this were P, this was N, N, P, N, N, P. That's what we did before. But now we're going to give a number to this. Okay, so we give the value 0 of our function to the terminal uh, vertex, so the one where the game ends. And let's see if we can compute the Grundy function now. So what's the Grundy function of this dot? Well, how do we do it? We look at where we can go from here. From here we can go there because we can take one out, right? So we can go from here to there. And that's the only place we can go. So the collection of numbers we should take max of consists of the, the number zero. There's only one number below this one. So we take the max of the set consistent of the, of the number zero. And the max of that is one. So this has the value of one. What's the value of two? Well, from here we can go there, subtracting one, or we can go there, subtracting two. So what is the max we should be taking? Well, we have two values, the value zero and the value one. So we take the max of the set zero, one, and that is two. So it looks like it should be pretty easy now. So the next one is three and so on. No, what's the next one? Huh? Well, if you believe what I said, you, can, you should be able to guess, because P should correspond to 0. Well, let's check that. Um, from 3, we can go to 2, and we can go to 1. So we take the max of 1 and 2, and 0 is not there. So it gets the value 0. So now you can trace this up, and you'll see that you get this periodicity of now the values of the function, not just the labels of the position. Okay. So then the point here is to make that um, that there is a recursive way to assign values integers to your positions, which follow this recursive rule. And so what we've done is that G is defined on all states of gamma in this recursive way. And the, the statement is that a P position corresponds exactly to the value of the function equal to 0 and an n position corresponds to the value of g not equal to 0. So with the analogy of this thing level is, is like the Grundy function some sort of angle, if you like. You can have zero angle or you can have any kind of angle which is recorded by this function g in some mysterious way. Okay, and so finally, what's the the um, theorem uh, that these guys, Frank, uh, Frege and Grundy, proved. That if you have several games, as usual, all of these are impartial games, that's all I'm talking about, then the Grundy fun each has a Grundy function. So now you make the gain gamma to be the sum in this way that we described of all of these games. And tell me what the theorem says. The Grundy function of the sum is the sum of the Grundy functions. 
but the sum in a funny way. Not the sum in the usual sense, but in what sense? We've seen it already, in a way. A, a NIM game consists of a sum of these silly games that um, you take um, one pile and you take anything you like from them. OK, maybe let me go slow. So I'll finish with this. So let's just take the one pile, any subtraction game. So that was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We, and in terms of labels, it was simply this. But let's compute the Grundy values. The, this is 0. What's the Grundy value of 1? One of two, you can go from two to one and two to zero. So it's two, three, four, five, six. So this silly game is just the Grundy function is the game. It just tells you how many things you have in its pile. And a nim game is a sum. Let me call this thing gamma zero just to use some notation. So a NIM game consists of this same game added any number of times. Each game represents one pile. So you sum as many as piles as you have. And what did we do to play this game? We took the number of things on the pile, we wrote it in binary, and then we added the columns in this funny way. So that's what the addition means. So addition here is this funny addition where you write, so the addition, say, of the number n with the number m is some number r. And what you do is you write n in binary, m in binary, and then you add in this mod 2 form. And that gives you the binary expansion of your sum. And that, if you're algebraic in incline is gives you on the set of integers 0 1 and so on it gives you a, a structure of a, a billion group it's just z2 cross z2 cross z2 cross z2 cross z2 infinitely many times and that's what this addition means and uh, Conway which cannot possibly be improved in any way calls things like this nimbers And this is the nimber addition. So the, the way to state the sum is that the Grundy function of a sum of games is the nimber sum of the Grundy functions of each individual game. So that, I think, uh, goes some ways into answering Stefan's question that um, you can think of, a grand, of any game is going to consist of um, well, even if it doesn't obviously decompose into some of things, it has, each position has a, has a Grundy value. And you can think of that as a pile in, one pile in NIM with that many things. Except that the game is funny that maybe you can go up sometimes in size. Some, so moves take you up or down depending on some obscure, or the obscure way how the, the game has been constructed. But it's in that sense that every game is like NIM. Because all you need to know to study the game, well, is the labels. But in more generally, you can uh, look at the Grundy value. And that sort of tells you how it uh, should be thought of as if it were a pile in NIM. And um, so like anything else that involves an isomorphism, uh, the question is, well, can you actually compute this isomorphism if you have a very large, complicated game? If you can't, then maybe this theory doesn't help you, or if it's expensive or difficult to do. So the question is, what, how complicated it is to compute this NIM, uh, sorry, this, um, this Grundy function? And well, it actually could be ex fairly complicated or fairly expensive computationally. Um, and in some cases, 
I think the actual values of for every state are not known. So they, there are uh, some games that are uh, really wickedly sort of devised in which you know how to compute it by an algorithm. We, we discussed this recursively, but in order to describe the um, the actual the actual function in some sort of closed form may be impossible or or just very difficult. And for example, in, in this, I th I'm not sure how much is known about subtraction games in general. The Grundy function is some periodic uh, thing in the size of your pile, but uh, the periodicity or the actual values of the Grundy function, I think, are in general not not known or not obviously uh, describable. Is sort of um, by a formula. And um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Maybe there's a question? So now go home and then play with your little brothers uh, <laughs> and impress them. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we have a little coffee and tea reception at the um, cafeteria for those who want to stay. Yeah, Harry. Uh, is there an I'm certainly not an expert, but as I said, I think uh, things like uh, how long it takes to compute the you know, algorithmic questions, you know, uh, those are really open, and the nature of the function in, in these complicated games is also maybe not known. Um, but um, yeah, I would say that those are the th things I've seen that people still are trying to answer. Yes. As far as I can tell, the, this is the operation that works for this uh, for describing the strategy and allowing you to recover strategies when you have several games that you combine. Um, you could um, try to def define multiplication of numbers. And if you are Henry Lindstrom, maybe you, you will be able to. But that, I don't think it, it's just a sort of a, a mathematical challenge. I don't know if it has anything implications to the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if the misere form. It's, it's what I mentioned at the beginning. It's called misere because it's sort of it's sort of a nasty, <laughs> uh, nasty kind of game. As far as I, what I've read, there is no th theory. It's just in general very difficult to understand how to play it efficiently. So it's a completely different story. Well, it's an impartial game with a different way of playing it, and the theory that we discuss somehow doesn't seem to say very much for that case. So the, I'm repeating the question so that we, we can hear it in the video. Um, the, only, the person who starts is the one who has a, a strategy to win. Well, it's like what we, what we did, right? You had a chance to win, but you didn't know how. So I took advantage of that and won. Sure, but I mean, if both know the strategy. If both know the strategy and computed these NMP things before coming to play, then they should be able to win if they don't make a mistake. Right? So the first one wins with having done the homework. Well, uh, sorry, uh, let's be clear. If, if the initial stage of the game is a P position, then the first person that, that plays cannot win. Right? It's, so it depends on what the position you're facing. If you see a P and it's your turn, you're likely to lose if the other person knows what they're doing. Uh, if you have an N, then you can win if you know what you're doing. Okay, thank you very much. See you in October. <laughs>